scaly reptilian skin is a great area to draw inspiration from and it can be used in a lot of different ways. Now this video and the accompanying blog post that goes with it is going to take a look at different kinds of reptile skin textures and how you can create them. I'll also cover a paint scheme for the makeup as I think this is helpful in deciding how far to take the sculpt. And it's also important to mention that reference is absolutely crucial, so do some digging and take a look at the variety of scales and skin textures that nature has in its palette. In the first instance, I want to run through some basic techniques on a flat area of plastiline, and then we can take these ideas and take them onto a face and sculpt a quick appliance to show them in action. So the first technique is really basic and it's a great way to quickly establish a reptilian scale pattern. You start by simply creating a series of lines, regularly spaced but with some variation, and then cover the whole area like this, occasionally giving the line some wiggle so that it isn't perfectly straight every time. Then crosshatch the opposite way to create a crisscross series of lines. This can be buffed back using a plastic brush or a coarse sponge. This abrasive action, it rounds off the edges of the scored lines, leaving a reasonably nice basic texture, which can function as a base for further work. This even mesh is actually quite flat, and by adding small lumps of plastiline onto each scale, you can make it rounder and more raised than too flat. Brushing this all back with the same stiff plastic brush blends these numerous lumps together quite quickly. Gentle raking, brushing and sponging will soften this off without obliterating the basic form. If you lose some of the lines that you want to get back, then you can re-establish them using a thin tool like this through some plastic sheeting. A small blowtorch or soldering torch like this can be used to help soften the scratches and lines too. It only takes a few brief moments exposure to the heat of the flame to soften these edges off. Just beware using it for too long as it can turn the sculpt into melted ice cream or worse still, burn your house down. Now the same technique can be applied to curved lines as well. So again, establish the path that you want the scales to follow and cross hatch them with lines going the opposing way. By shifting the angles and how close together they are, you can get a huge variety of sizes in the scales. Now scales can be repetitive and when they're really small they can be so numerous that they can become incredibly time consuming and while you can cross hatch lines to rapidly build up some textures these square or sort of diamond shapes they may not be right for everything so making some tools can help to do this i've used some brass tubing of various sizes and i've chosen four different sizes and cut them using a pipe cutter like this Now, if you don't have a pipe cutter, you can achieve the same neat cut using a utility knife and carefully rolling the tube back and forth with the blade. Once the tubing is cut into some convenient two inch sections, I crimp the middles to flatten them. This will make it easy to use them later. You can use pliers, grips, or even a vise, whatever works for you. Next, I want to squash and distort the ends of the tubing to create a pleasing scale shape. Perfectly round is too regular, so it's worth tweaking the shape using long nose pliers like this to create more elliptical and irregular shapes. Then I mix a little car body filler and push this into the ends of the tubing and leave it to set. When the filler's hardened, I can use a rotary tool like a Dremel to create a hollow scoop in the filler like this. 
It's very important to ensure that you have some kind of dust extraction and use a respirator to prevent you from breathing in the dust that you create when you're doing this. So now we have a series of eight different size scale shapes, descending in sizes from six to seven millimeters wide down to three or four millimeters wide. Pressing these into the plastiline, you can quickly create a series of scale shapes in a line, which appears regular and systematic, just like real scales. By interlocking successive lines and graduating them down in size, you can pretty quickly create a nice variety of shapes and textures without having to carve out each individual scale. If you do the same thing through sheets of plastic, you get a smoothing effect as the pressing down of a new scale softens the edge of the one next to it as the plastic gets stretched tight. This is quite an effective technique, and although you may need to occasionally fix an unconvincing shape between some of the press scales, you do save an awful lot of time by working this way. You can also rotate the tool and alternate the ends to create enough variation that it looks not too perfect or manufactured. So let's sculpt an appliance on the face cast using the techniques covered on the flatboard exercises. I've penciled in the rough shapes on the face and now I need to start blocking them out with blobs of plastiline. There will be numerous small scales on the jaw area, so for now I'm just going to block in a thin sheet of plastiline here, ready to take the stamps I made earlier. I use the stamps through the plastic and make them interweave to create regular lines of scales. Going back to the larger scales, I can round the edges off with a twisted brass loop. Wherever there's a shape created between scales that you don't like, it's easy to go in and clean it up with a small loop tool like this. Where the piece finishes, I want to graduate and blend out the edge so that the texture sits on gradually thinning plastiline. And I'm using a ball end of a steel tool, which works quite well for this. Punching through plastic with the smaller scale tool makes a nice blend from the sculpt to the human skin. It seems a good time to press some more small scales into those thinner areas which have been neglected, like the lip area. A quick blast with a brush and a coarse sponge helps smooth the surface back, and I can neaten it by filling in any areas which are missing plastiline. This happens a lot on recesses and is known as a touchdown, as it's where the mould would actually be touching down onto the core, which would create holes in the finished appliance. Working into these through some plastic means I can smooth in some natural looking lines and wrinkles. After I've raked some lines through plastic onto the scales, I polish it back slightly with a soft brush and some alcohol. And I use this 99% alcohol because it will evaporate completely without leaving any kind of oily residue. Now, if you recall the liquid clay I made previously using naphtha and plastiline in the last video, I'm going to use that again. If you didn't see that, then check out the video on sculpting skin textures. I'm using this again to drop tiny lumps onto the edges to help blend the effect out into the skin more gradually. 
I started out by using a brush, but I quickly got bored of this method, so I opted instead to put the mixture into a syringe and use the needle as a dropper. And I start popping the tiny blobs on with that instead. As you can see, I really got into this technique and added blobs all over the edges to graduate the effect without having to actually sculpt each individual tiny blob. Once this has had a chance to dry overnight, I can powder the surface to see what the final sculpt would look like. Now I would normally be in a position to make a mold of this piece now, but I wanted instead to do a quick paint finish on the sculpt to see what the final effect would be. It's also quite nice to skip the whole molding, casting and application stages and still be able to see the final product. Now before I start painting, I want to protect the sculpt so that I can peel this all off easily when I'm ready to make a mold. So the first thing is I spray the entire surface with a few coats of release agent. Then I sprayed several thin coats of bald cap plastic thinned down with the acetone so that it can go through an airbrush. This thin film of plastic covers the whole surface and can peel away easily. It will sit there invisibly for now, but all the paint that I'm going to apply will sit on top of this thin membrane. I start with a base coat of pale sandy coloured acrylic paint. And once this has dried, a few thin splatters of green and brown are applied to break up the flat colour and give it some texture. Now I'm using acrylic inks with a mixture of water and alcohol to speed up the drying time. Then I spray a darker green ink into the recessed areas following the lines of the sculpt. Now in order to help blend the sculpt into the skin, I've extended the effect up into the brow where I didn't actually sculpt anything. Next I can pop a thin dark green wash into it and it collects in all the creases making them darker. Because of the watery collection of paint in these recesses, I'm using a blow dryer to speed up the drying. I use the same colour in that wash to put some harder lines into the forehead. I'm trying to replicate the three dimensional effects of the cheek sculpt using just colour. A few areas of the cheek get a dark wash in the creases too, and then it's time to spatter a few more colours on top. Once it's all dry, it's time to dry brush the high points using the same base coat that I started out with. If you're not familiar with the technique, dry brushing involves using a small amount of paint on a brush which is wiped until it's almost completely dry and then the brush is wiped over the surface repeatedly with each stroke depositing a small amount of the remaining paint on the highest points. When a darker wash has been used in the recessed areas and the paler dry brush is used in the raised areas, it gives a more three-dimensional effect which is useful for creating depth without making a piece overly thick or heavy. The same colour is dabbed onto what would be the high points on the forehead scales. Then, once the highlighting is done, I punch up the dark areas using a thin black greeny ink colour airbrushed in directly. I also spray a kind of a snake skin pattern onto the smaller scales to help sell this as a reptile skin. Now these little blobs in the corner that, where I've sculpted, they kind of finish too suddenly, so to help blend these blobs across, I also create some just using paint where it's smooth on the core. Now, I could have simply extended the sculpt instead, but it's interesting to try and replicate the effect in just paint. So I've done these pale blobs first, and once they've dried, I darken underneath and in between each one, essentially creating the same kind of effect as the actual sculpted bumps next to it. The 
The final step is just to matte the surface down using a matte medium to remove some of the shine. Now I'm using a Liquitex brand matte medium, but there are others out there that work just as well as this. And there we have it, the finished look. And the best part is I can just peel this all away to get back to a clean sculpt ready for moulding.